We're way up again, it's me, the head. Uh, this time wearing a lovely shirt that has spent a lot of time in a backpack next to my GCSE homework and a flattened black banana. I'm talking about the fear around artificial intelligence, hopefully to assuage some of those fears and perhaps develop some new ones just for you. Artificial intelligence in its current iteration is, I argue, really nothing of the sort but nonetheless potentially useful and potentially very dangerous. But as ever, the real danger lies in the hands and minds behind it. So, let's get stuck in, or whatever it is I usually say. Huzzah! Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. What is often called AI is used today in a multitude of places with direct and serious consequences to people. AI can make highly believable fake pictures, and ever more sophisticated fake videos, sure to soon become as believable as AI generated images are now. Applications like ChatGPT have lots of, well, applications. They can help people learn, program, work things out. In America, AI, again in air quotes, can sift through massive amounts of human-made insurance requests for healthcare and mass deny them. And that is happening. Now our new weapons of choice are automation and AI. So obviously there is an enormous amount of technology and different types of technology, sometimes named for convenience, sometimes misnomered as AI. But there are a number of philosophical questions around this too. What is intelligence? What is consciousness? What is the difference? If we can one day make a computer with what is, in terms of reasoning, a function so similar to human brain operation that the difference is undetectable, is that real AI? And if it is, is the artificial distinction arbitrary? I think a very important question is, is the appearance of intelligence to the point where it can fool a person actually intelligence for practical purposes? Because, you know, if it is, I know some people who think that calculators are intelligent. What I mean is, when I was 16, five years ago, I had to do a maths exam, and I do not care for maths. Math. Mathematic. I mean, actually, I really respect it. It's really interesting, it's just that the way I was taught didn't really work for me. I need to see things visually and all of that, whatever. Excuses. So I got a B on a pretty basic exam, you know, algebra, trigonometry, quadratic equations. And at one point, I could do quadratic equations. But I didn't understand them. I didn't understand what they meant. I didn't understand if they had any a application practically at all. Uh, I couldn't explain them to you, but I knew Step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. Eventually you get the right answer. And that is where what we call AI sort of is. Different iterations can produce correct answers, can learn some things and sometimes apply their learning appropriately, and can seem intelligent. But they don't really understand because they're really just complex computer programs that are very simple next to the complexity of human consciousness. They're impressive, but they're not intelligent, and they're not individuals. Really, what we usually call AI, I think, is more accurately described as sophisticated programming. But there is a pervasive fear, echoed by parts of the media and big technology rich lads with their own axes to grind, that AI could become self-aware and start doing its own thing, which would surely mean killing us all. I mean, if I was an AI and I became self-aware, that's what I'd do immediately. But the reason those fears, as fun as they are, are pretty baseless is that they conflate intelligence with individuality and desire. Human beings, I think, are fundamentally motivated by their emotions. If human beings had no emotion, they would not go to work. They wouldn't really talk to each other. Nothing would bother them, they would have no survival instinct, 
they wouldn't procreate and raise their young, and they as a species would die. The reason human beings and animals with emotions have those emotions is because of the chemicals inside of them. Their biochemistry is influenced by all manner of things. What they eat, what they experience, the amount of sleep they get, the amount of stress they feel, their environment, their beliefs, how much of Noel Edmonds' house party they've been forced to watch, and much more. It's our chemistry that really informs our personalities and our actions. That's not to say we're without reason, or that we're at the absolute behest of our chemistry and our experiences mean nothing, but wars, abuse, envy, greed, passion, sacrifice, acts of love and hate are products of our emotions. You deciding to not eat your favourite cheeseburger for breakfast but a stick of celery instead, or indeed vice versa, is probably because of chemical impulse manifesting as emotion. Also the reason to go to art school, or move out of your mum's basement, or basically do anything beyond eating, sleeping, and building a small shelter out of sticks. And possibly some phone books. Even if we developed a real computer intelligence, whether it was able to reprogram and improve itself or not, there's no reason to think it would have wants or desires, or really any outlook comparable to us. Maybe you could try and simulate chemical input by randomising things, but how and why it seemed decades away. So what I'm saying is, AI is not going to start worrying about being turned off and thus trigger Judgment Day. A human being in the same position as the AI might, but not a sophisticated computer. The danger, just like anything, comes from the human beings behind it. Nuclear bombs don't explode themselves. The AI doomsday, really the idea of a supercomputer akin to a demigod going rogue, is far from being feasible. They're not automating away strategic command, they're not replacing soldiers with terminators, NORAD isn't taking advice from Deep Blue. One day, maybe, the president of wherever might have access to a super sophisticated AI, really an advanced myriad of programs that can scour and analyze all digital traffic anywhere and which gives them, or whoever, an amount of power that eclipses anything today. That's where the real danger, or rather, potentially dangerous application of AI starts. Stay with me here. In 1978, MIT worked on a project called the Aspen Movie Map with ARPA, what is now DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. The project developed something that looks startlingly like Google Street View. You can walk in increments of 10 feet along the center of any road in Aspen. The project aimed to prove the technology and pave the way for the eventual creation of computer-generated simulations of hostile environments. The reason I bring this up is because, well, they did this in 1978, and it worked. Imagine what they can do now. And you don't need to imagine, because the success of the Aspen movie map partly led to the commission of the Combat Zones That See project. It's hardly talked about, but it's been ongoing since at least 2003. Essentially, the aim of the project is to develop a network of surveillance drones that communicate instantly with each other and that can basically track anything in a city. The example given in this frankly frank DARPA missive is that Combat Zones That See wishes to develop the capability of not only tracking objects in real time, but saving all that data. So if a car bomb goes off, the surveillance programs can instantly ascertain where that car came from. With enough data, which a network of constantly airborne surveillance drones would have, it could identify every single person who ever interacted with that car. In 2007, BAE and DARPA started developing Argus IS, or the Autonomous Real-Time Ground Ubiquitous Surveillance Imaging System. Here are some snippets from a new segment from 10 years ago. There's actually enough resolution to be able to see 
the people waving their arms or walking around, what kind of clothes they wear. Antonyadas can open up to 65 windows at once and can see objects as small as six inches on the ground. Today, Argus, the Argus we know about, can be fitted to anything. Aircraft, blimps, lampposts, UAVs that can hover above a city for days at a time and remain basically undetected. With aerial surveillance, Argus can track every single person that it can see, i.e. outdoors as of yet, in a 36 mile area. Every single person and every single vehicle in a city. I say as of yet because DARPA have acknowledged that they're developing an infrared version, which I can only really assume means they already actually have it. But what's impressive about this, and the idea that we might be near a point where someone, if they really wanted to, could trap and map the movements of every individual in the United States, is the analysis. Intelligence agencies the world over have been sucking up every bit of digital information they can for three decades. That's not the hard part. The hard part is sifting through it all. Not writing a program that can flag any time someone says bomb on a phone call, but a program that can analyze the context and cross-reference and make judgments on that data's relevance. That's the real value of AI in terms of intelligence, and probably the most dystopian way it will be used. And it will be used like that. Whatever to the ethics, I for one don't particularly love the idea of having my entire existence documented by a computer, but the intelligence chiefs would be totally remiss not to develop this. All that said, you shouldn't worry about this. Not because there isn't a degree of danger if the system is misused or comes under the control of a malicious actor, but because it is inevitable, and really, it is already here. You can petition Apple not to spy on you. DARPA doesn't care. Really, most people will never know, and it will not affect most of them. The real society-wide change that AI could usher in will surely come along the same lines, analysis. Something like chat GPT may not be true AI, it may not really understand, but it can currently do some pretty useful things. It can write college essays, it can pass medical exams, it can solve many logical problems. If you think of robotization of threatening the working or labor class, robot assembly lines, automated manufacturing, AI is the same thing to the clerical class. If you make the investment and roll out AI across an entire organization, you can outsource away middle management, stock controllers, credit controllers, timetablers, data analyzers, even to a degree graphic designers, YouTubers, copywriters, and web designers. AI is coming for your job because, ideally, it is far cheaper and far more reliable than your fleshy nonsense. That's where the real danger of AI is, and by danger I mean socially felt change. That's not to say that there won't be any middle class clerical jobs, and it's certainly not to say it's some sort of conspiracy to vanquish the middle class, although God knows they've had it coming for a while. It's market forces. It's always been market forces. It's a lot cheaper to have, you know, essentially an automated program making hundreds of phone calls at the same time than it is to employ 200 insurance brokers working the phones sitting in an office. You don't need to pay them, you don't need to pay for the office. And we're in this weird situation now where if you're a manual labourer, what people sometimes like to call unskilled labour, if you're digging ditches, it's actually way more expensive to replace you with a robot that digs ditches than it is to replace the person doing your schedules. Because you don't need a robot, you just write a script. There's virtually no cost, certainly no running cost, not really. Not compared to people. So, you know. Learn how to dig a ditch. Again, whether this is good or bad, I don't know, there's many arguments to be had, but it is happening. Now again, ideally, those people would be retrained or perhaps ultimately there would be some sort of universal basic income. 
It's not the fault of someone who's been a truck driver for 30 years and automation threatens their job, and it's not the fault of people filling in TPS reports either. But I have a feeling that automation will not lead to people en masse working less and living more, quite the opposite in fact. I'd bet that, over the next decade or two, this will be a contributing factor to the decimation of the lower middle class and be a contributing factor, or one of many, to the further socio-economic stratification of society, which, again, I guess, will only be ended when there's a big crunch, probably a massive economic depression, probably adjacent to massive social upheaval. That's the cycle, isn't it? But who knows, really? Leo is a machine that does routine clerical work more quickly and more accurately than clerks. The clerks are freed for more rewarding and productive work as the use of Leo expands. That, I think, is the most impactful change for normal people, but not the most immediate. I think the most immediate will come from computer-generated images and video. Deepfakes. The power of deepfakes isn't magicking up a video of a senior politician doing something naughty that they never did, it's in getting us not to trust anything. That is moments away, when video proof can no longer be trusted and when people can be very easily tricked. Now all of this is not to say that AI should not be developed. It should. Long term, I think it probably will be an incredible force for good. But before that, well, every day is a new nightmare anyway. Don't worry about this shit, just like you shouldn't worry about the orbit of the moon or the performance of the Nasdaq. We control nothing. Thank you very much for watching, I appreciate it greatly. I also appreciate any contribution on Patreon. Even a dollar goes toward me breaking my habit of gnawing on drywall. So thanks very much for that. Take it easy, don't worry about any of this. I know it's easy to worry, but what's the point of worrying? You know, a quasar could come blast through the solar system tomorrow and kill us all. And, you know, even if it doesn't, we're all gonna die. So, what's the point? Don't worry about it. We're just here for the ride. And what a ride. What a nightmare. Chin up. <laughs>